How do you know that you've met the spec? How do other staff members know? How do partners know? How do future members of your own staff know? So a program foundation is setting the context for how you'll do open source license compliance. And in the case of the OpenChain ISO 5230 standard, uh, this is really about understanding the roles and responsibilities, the scope of the program, and the type of processes you should have in place. Nowadays, we tend to address program scope by OSPOs or virtual OSPOs. An OSPO is an open source program office, and it can either be staffed, so that's a general OSPO, or it can be a virtual OSPO where the open source program office effectively is a side job for some key personnel. Um, and they come together to uh, you know, define what the program's doing, why it's doing it, and what process points should be followed by the rest of the staff. So far, so good. Uh, that series of notes can be expanded on with you know, actual reference material. There's an open chain resource overview, which I've linked to in the slides, and you'll be getting a copy of the slides in your email, uh, and a deep dive into open source program offices to contextualize how and what they do. Again, rather than making a list of this stuff, and this is thr true throughout the open chain standard, um, we identify a few key items about a program foundation and leave it at that. So it's really a case of define the roles and responsibilities, full stop. It's up to you to do that definition. Define the program scope, full stop. It's up to you to define the program and then put in place processes, pause, dot, dot, dot. And we'll talk about the key processes in the other sections. The rest of it, process content, as throughout the standard is up to you. And that's why I linked some example material to get you started if you so wish. This is all purposeful. We don't want to be prescriptive because as mentioned before, every company, every sector, every continent, people have different requirements, not one size fits all beyond the general approach. Moving on for the uh, standard itself and actually the thinking pattern you probably need to be most efficient here is the idea of you know, defining the actual tasks that an open source compliance program should do. And this goes to roles and responsibilities. Who are the people? And here we're talking about the job roles uh, rather than an individual per se. Who are the people who should manage the key items from open source compliance? This means and this is boiling it down a little bit. Uh, people, for example, who receive external inquiries related to compliance. And of course, people who do things like receive internal inquiries from developers. The list is not long. It's a short few items that need to be done to ensure things run smoothly. In fact, in many companies, it's perfectly possible to do this with two or three people in a virtual OSPO effectively, as long as you, well, as long as you use industry approaches that we've, as I said, refined over time. One of the most important points is that people should have clarity on what they do. And of course, it should be documented. Uh, over time, people swap out, staff move on, Institutional knowledge versus personal knowledge is often not perfectly balanced. And surely during the pandemic, this was illustrated in the most stark manner, as a ton of people decided, and you know, rightfully so, that their own personal desires for how they want to live trump their, let's say, occupational expectations. A company is built on knowing what the company does for maximum efficiency, how to build a product as best possible, how to support it, and in areas that are touching on legal matters, how to manage the governance of the software, how to manage things like compliance and patents, 
uh, in a way that doesn't depend on Bob or Susan down the hall. It depends on the virtual open source program office roles as defined and documented uh, in a manner that any engineer or manager or legal personnel around the company can pick up a document and understand quickly. The next aspect of the standard then is to say we've defined our roles and responsibilities. What is it that people do? And uh, again, we kept this super, super simple. We don't want to overwhelm people with a, a list of items to do that is daunting or more importantly, impossible to implement. So this is about identifying, tracking, and having an inventory of open source components uh, in software flowing through your company. A key aspect of that is the licensing, but it's not the only aspect. You want to know what's the software, what's the version, where it came from, where I'm storing it, and where it's going in my org and outside my legal entity. Uh, this includes understanding how the software entering and being maintained in your company has evolved over the years. For example, when we started using PackageX at version Y, what did we use it for versus what do we use it for now? That type of knowledge is important because, quick example, you might be using software internally and therefore not too worried about licenses that are triggered on distribution between legal entities. And then the same software at some point starts to go into a product which is distributed. When you have records, it becomes very easy to address that. When you don't have records, you have to go back and do all kinds of remediation to find out what you have done, what your engineers have done, what your support team has done over the years. And that is a colossal waste of company resources. And then, of course, uh, implementing actual licensing policies and processes that deal with the way that your software is actually distributed. So breaking that down, knowing what's there and knowing how to deal with it. Uh, there are, of course, a lot of approaches to doing this. Many people start with essentially manually approaching it. But uh, as you scale, you may be doing a stuff like having automation and this is where compliance tooling and portals by companies like FOSA can be very helpful. And you may look at having documentation uh, available in stuff like your developer portal. So any individual in the company, particularly those addressing software, can in a few clicks double check the uh, review and approval processes and maybe even access records of what particular software has done in the company in the past so they can mental model what they want to do in the future and in particularly if they're doing something new realize ah i should reach out to my ospo on this or i should reach out to legal on this this is you know fairly obvious stuff and like i said we keep it to the absolute minimum in process points identified uh, but once you get this right, you significantly reduce the amount of time and money you spend dealing with open source license compliance. And that's what we want to do internally. Externally, if your suppliers are doing this, and if you're doing this for your purchasing buyer companies, uh, you're both wasting a lot less time in trying to make sure everything works smoothly. Again, impact on product time to market, and resource usage on getting that product to market. OK, so once you've worked out how, you have to look at records of what you did. And this is really about making sure that when you're doing compliance, you do it right. So know what you should be doing, and then making sure that you are able to double check that later. So documented procedures. This is really about keeping notes about what you just did. Previous section told you what to do. This section tells you <laughs> how to remember what you just did for specific products and specific software packages. Now, again, you can automate 
artifact creation, those records with stuff like Fossa. And or you can do things like have internal repositories to ar archive the artifacts. <clears throat> I do apologize. When it comes to, let's say, internal records, this is super important uh, for companies in areas such as industrial, automotive, infrastructure. Uh, when, when we talk about, let's say, consumer electronics, most consumer electronics have, let's say, a six-month maximum sale window or optimal sale window, and then it tails off and a year later you introduce the new version. When it comes to automotive products, you're looking at seven years to market and a support cycle that might go on for another three or eight years. When you're looking at things like industrial, let's say you're building a train, you're looking at 30 years to market, maybe more, and a support cycle that might take the product to a 50-year life cycle, maybe more. And then when you get to things like nuclear reactors, you're looking at 50 years for the basic life cycle. Anyway, point is uh, you want to keep long-term records and internal repositories are useful for that. And then utilizing things like SPOMs allow you to have the metadata and context. So instead of just knowing what the software package is, having a lot more data about why it is and what's going on with it. This stuff, uh, to put it bluntly, often helps companies a lot regarding the future of their product support cycle, particularly if that cycle is longer than consumer electronics. And though, and I'll stress this, uh, consumer electronics needs to have archives just as much as anywhere else. You just might need them for less time. Then we come to an interesting one, open source community engagement. I particularly like this one because it is an area where it's very easy for many parties to get prescriptive. You know, it's, it's very easy for people to say, oh, you must contribute and you must do it in X, Y, Z fashion. Uh, in the case of OpenChain, we're agnostic. In fact, this ISO standard is pretty much agnostic about everything. It doesn't care what your policy content is. It doesn't care what your process content is. It doesn't care how you engage with the community. As long as you have knowledge yourself for filling out those process content. In community engagement, essentially, we ask that you have a process or a policy for defining what you do. So your employees can know where the red lines are. So your management can quickly check where the potential or lack of it lies around open source. Having a policy for community engagement and making sure that everyone in the company knows about it and can access it really makes it a lot simpler for your employees to know what they can and should do. A quick example here, I mentioned open source is really good for recruitment. And that means a lot of your developers are already playing in open source. When they're part of your company and they're playing with open source, let's say in their free time, it's quite useful for them to be really clear on how they can represent their activity. To what extent can they or can they not mention your company? To what extent can they and can they not contribute to open source on company time where it's to the company's benefit, and so on and so forth. The actual policy doesn't matter as much as having a policy, including if the policy is simply, we don't do open source at this company, no one can represent this company as engaging with development on an open source project. I'll do a side note here, and this is a digression, but an important one because this is framed as business intelligence around open source compliance. Uh, the digression is that having a policy that disallows open source engagement is the safest approach from the optic of, let's say, legal being cautious, though it's not the optimal approach for utilizing open source. Bear in mind, open source is 
collaboratively developed software. Essentially, you're outsourcing R&D and maintenance to a global community. And that means you put in a small percentage and you get 100% back. Engagement with open source projects, framed right, allows a company to continue to get that benefit over time in the software packages and to optimize that benefit for their own product categories. So uh, while policies can have don't do anything with open source community, most companies don't find that super realistic over time. And they have to make some calls about to what extent they will engage and to what extent they won't. And that's where things get a tiny bit tricky. And if you don't document it properly, people might fall outside your lines completely inadvertently. Just like the other sections of the standard, this is a simple call, a simple policy that's communicated to your team and you determine what the policy is. And then finally, arguably the most important part beyond simply having a compliance program is being able to understand what your compliance program is doing around compliance and making sure it's current. Uh, first of all, documentation that explains how you met the ISO standard, in other words, how you made the calls around process content, helps you and your successors and your customers understand what you're doing. Documentation confirming that you review the program every 18 months, make sure that you continue to do it. Uh, we find both points super important. The first point is super important because you will lose the institutional knowledge of what the requirements in the program are doing over time. And the second point is super important because it provides a trigger to prevent the loss of institutional knowledge with the loss of personal knowledge over time. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, products have a far longer life cycle than you may expect when you first think about it. Even if you have a yearly update on a product, it's entirely possible that a customer will come back to you with that product in two or three or four years and ask for the open source source code that they want related to the product. Being able to give them that or being able to give an open source developer that is actually a pretty small lift if you have good processes in place. It's a much heavier lift if you don't. Same token, your customers might bounce back to you at any time, let's say a corporate customer, and start asking questions about a product that they bought now or bought previously. Particularly with complex corporate business to business products, it can be a large ask for people to unpack, let's say on-premises complex software. Again, if you have good processes initially and you have good records subsequent, it's very easy to say, ah, yes, product number 823, here's the archive and the SBOM, here's more information if you need it, and that's that. As opposed to thinking product 823, my goodness, what the development actually do here, and trying to chase down what they did and dealing with the fact that some of them have moved on, that never, never really works efficiently for businesses. And that's it. That's what the ISO standard does.